The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 18. Glory to you, O Lord. Glory to you. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Judeans replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world. To testify to the truth, Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The people answered him, We have a law, and according to the law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? 
Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the people cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the people, Here is your king. They cried, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carried, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scriptures says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. 
So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his, so his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you, Christ. Please be seated. Oh, precious God, be present with us on this day where we remember and hold close to our heart the story of Christ's crucifixion, death, and the grief that we feel. O oh Lord, it is a mystery and so hard to comprehend. Give us breath, your heart, your compassion, and teach us how to move through these days. O oh Lord, we pray. Amen. God knows what it is to feel abandoned by God. God is with you in that terrible aloneness. Your longing is God. Nothing, not even the sense that God has abandoned you, can separate you from God. And that cross, that tomb, because God is in it, is unable to be final or complete. That's a Steve Garnis unfolding light meditations. And another quote, true eternity, rather than being opposed to time, is revealed in the very heart of temporal existence. And Oliver Clement, observation, and from the book James, How to Inhabit Time. In my own life, death is very difficult to understand. I'm not at all comfortable with death. Um, so it's a wonder to me sometimes why I worked at hospice and why I work in the hospital. And being present with my dad when he passed and my husband when he passed. However, I know the very moment holds everything that God has to offer right inside of us. How come sometimes then does it feel that God can be so absent? And how come sometimes it can feel like such a communal fault? perpetuation of evil and pain 
feels so permanent. Sometimes it feels like it's continually chosen over the good, the righteous, and the merciful. Why the suffering? What does it take for us to follow God's plan? What is God's plan? I just came from visiting my mom who has dementia. And it's not easy when it's the afternoon and she's beside herself. And they don't, don't know what to do, you know, to help. Um, and it becomes a little uncomfortable, too, with people around who want to help and how to help. And does she want to go to sleep? Or... And when she sees me, she cries. So people think, you better go because you make her cry. <laughs> it's the reminder of who she is and who she wants to be when she sees me and who she's lost. My dad died in July. It wasn't an easy marriage, but 68 years. For the Buddhists, in my thought, I'm a chaplain, so I work with a lot of people, and I'm interested in different ways of understanding. Suffering is what I understand, is a part of life. There's this understanding that suffering is a part of life. And reconciliation to that becomes a way through. Releasing attachments, finding balance. In a more pagan understanding of the world, life has seasons. The earth, death and rebirth is part of process. It's a natural cycle. In Judaism, God's will is a mystery and the way to follow God's good commandments. And they're the sin and the return to God. In, in many faiths, humans falter. There's decay, there's violence, there's loss, there's change. Sometimes I think we forget it's not so much what we believe that makes us valuable. It's that we are here, we are created, and everything else along us, every creature, and the earth is part of a whole. It's, I think, about Jesus' faith, the faith of God in us, what God does for us that we can hold in these times. The cross can be that symbol of descent into darkness, into chaos, into the unknown, the depths of human experience. That we all face in life. In the face of this time of when things are difficult. To trust that there's a presence of love and mercy and forgiveness. And we come to this existential truth. The wonder of how it is that we're here right now. What does it mean to be alive and existing in this very moment, in this vulnerable body? The truth of existence, we can tend to panic. This existential angst. 
I can stand here and talk about what I think about the cross, what I read about our stories, what I experience in my life, what I imagine and hear from people, from you in your life, in your journey. What do we each face as the youth who is trying to understand their own life and the emotions that they're facing and the crises that are in schools, trying to figure out who they are in this fallen world? In this moment, we realize our time is short. We are fragile. We are not going to live forever. And death will have us all. So what is important when we find someone who's suffering? Jesus looked at his Mother said, here is your son. And looked at his friend and said, here is your mother. This is our story. And though we hear these fighting realities of how it's going to go, we hear people being blamed and people accusing, people questioning, trying to figure out. Even today, we still have the roots of anti-Semitism as we imagine it was the Jews. And yet we know we are each of these in the story. Pilate. Caiaphas, the Jews, Mary, Peter. This is us. We are them. And Christ also. Whatever the events, the who, the what, the where, the when, the realities of the crucifixion only mark in our hearts the truth of our life together. In this world, in this moment, we cannot blame anyone for our frailties, but the systems that perpetuate our limitations. We must face these ourselves and try to be honest like Christ. And I hope we have learned one thing that we are all the same. The animals, the earth, the heartbeat, the heartbeat of God so loved the world and so we cry this day, this day of brutal mourning. As the crucifixion unfolds before us. As it is meet and right so to do. And we join our maker and one another. In solemn observation, and hope. Thank you, God. We pray for your help that we may respond in love to one another and to you. In your name we pray. Amen.